Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I would like to start with the uh, quotation from Whitehead that the safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. And in this talk, I would like to argue that not only philosophy owes so much to Plato, as the quotation indicates, but also, maybe a little unexpectedly, physics, more specifically, the talk will be devoted to an analogy between the difference of Plato's and Aristotle's thoughts, in general terms, objective idealism and empiricism, and the difference of the paradigms between the Newtonian physics and the modern quantum mechanical and Einsteinian physics, as developed from the beginning of the 20th century. The mere existence of this analogy is striking, to say the least, bearing in mind that there are at almost two and a half thousand years that separate these two phenomena. Plato lived 428 to 348 BC, and Aristotle 384 to 322 BC. It is also amusing to note that the change was chronologically reversed in both cases. Aristotle, as a disciple of Plato, dominated the approach to physics for more than 2,000 years. And a hundred years ago, we returned in physics to the Plato's ideas. Obviously, the talk will give a very simplified account of both philosophical and physical sides of the story. Before we discuss the achievements of Greek thought, let us discuss the process of so-called idealization that is characteristic to modern physics. For any physical description of, say, a ball on an inclined plane, we have to strip the whole process of a huge number of properties that do not have an impact, or we suspect that they have a negligible impact on the process. For the ball, one can list those irrelevant properties as, for example, a color of the ball, the name of the owner, and millions of other features apparently irrelevant for the physics. One leaves only several numbers, like moment of inertia, radius of the ball, friction coefficient, plane angle, and the properties that are judged sufficient to describe the process physically. These few numbers are used to predict, using mathematical operations dictated by the laws of physics, the outcome of the experiment, and the numbers are then translated back into the real world. The stripping of irrelevant features and translation of the real world into numbers is called idealization and plays a fundamental role in any physical description. One should really be amazed how effectively this reduction works and how little is needed for the precise description of the physical side of any phenomenon. On the other hand, it also points to how much drops out of this description that can be important or even crucial for other purposes. However, a question arises. To what extent does the idealized notion of a ball exist and in what sense? The Platonic answer is very different from the Aristotelian one. Coming back to the achievements of our predecessors, the most underestimated seems to be the Hellenic period, approximately from the death of Alexander the Great, 323 BC, by the way, whose teacher was Aristotle, to the destruction of Syracuse and murdering Archimedes, 212 BC. Even now, we quote the measurement of the Earth's circumference by Eratosthenes, uh, by the way, unbelievably precise, usually without deeper thinking what such a measurement really required. Eratosthenes actually had to employ fully the process of idealization. He had to treat the real Earth as a geometric ball. Know that Alexandria and Siena, now called Asuan, have similar longitude, although he was probably aware of several degrees of the difference. 
he had to put the sun very far away, and it is very non-trivial. Uh, use geometric relation of parallel lines on two different latitudes on a sphere. Solve the geometric problem, and at the end, translate the result of the calculation into the real 250,000 stadii, extremely close to the actual 40,000 kilometers. By the way, he knew the distance because of textbooks that were really very precise because the access to Nile was uh, taxed. One could quote many such examples. Hipparchus, with his very large catalog of stars used three centuries later by Ptolemy. Stesibius from Alexandria, father of pneumatics, inventor of precise water clock, the best time measuring device for the next 2,000 years, and elaboration on the atmospheric pressure introduced earlier by Empedocles. See, for example, Lucio Rosso, La Rivoluzione Dimenticata, for dozens of other examples. Unfortunately, these authors are only mentioned in very few scattered sources, mostly secondhand. Even the Euclid's Elements, the most famous mathematical book ever written, is not from the 9th century copy. That means 12 centuries after the original book was written. The fact that originals were lost stems probably from the fact that the later generations starting from the Romans, were generally unable to understand the sophisticated ways of logic and reasoning so that the Greek originals were either completely neglected, quoted mutilated to the now seemingly ridiculous forms, or just destroyed, as it happened at least twice in the first and third century AD with the library of Alexandria, burned by the Romans. As an example, one can quote the fact, known in Hellenic time, that bees use hexagon construction in honeycombs. With a given circumference, covering a plane with hexagons has the biggest area to circumference ratio, so it needs the least amount of walks. This was proven only 20 years ago. In the later quotation from Plinius, it is written that the bees use hexagons because hexagons are best adapted to six legs of a bee. As a di digression, let us mention that Kepler, in his book, Six Corner Snowflake, undertook the subject almost 2,000 years later, asking the question, what should be the angle between the three rhombi of the end cup of the honeycomb to have the largest volume with the smallest amount of walks needed? He came to the conclusion that the B cell should have 109 degrees 29 minutes between the rhombi, as is actually observed, with obviously some small deviations in the real honeycombs. However, it is now known that more complex end caps, not only with rhombi, with hexagons and squares are possible that give even better ratio, but they are much more complicated. The problem of the best end cap is not solved until today. I have to confess that my interest in Plato's thought is not only purely academic, but has also a personal origin. My grand-grandfather, Vincent Lutosławski, was a great admirer of Plato, knew fluently the Old Greek, and incidentally 10 other languages, studied for many years the Plato's dialogues, and, and, was, and has written a book, The Origin and Growth of Plato's Logic, published in London in 1897. In the book written in La Coruña, his wife and my grand-grandmother was Sofia Casanova, Spanish poet and writer, by the scrupulous analysis of the language of the dialogues, he was able to establish their chronology and describe in detail the evolution of the Plato's thought. It is really miraculous that the entire written heritage of Plato was preserved and we actually know of no Plato's dialogue that was mentioned or cited, but the text itself disappeared. The situation is very rare indeed. Among the ancient Greek philosophers, for example, earlier Democritus, famous for the conjecture of the existence of atoms, is known to have written 60 works, none of which survived. 
The works of the above-mentioned authors of the Hellenic period are, as we said, extremely scarce. Even the Aristotle philosophical output is known with much less completeness than Plato's. It is estimated that about one-third of his papers survived in any form till today. The reason for this amazing fact of the full preservation of the Plato's heritage is not fully understood. It probably stems from an almost religious attitude of the disciples of the Plato's Academia to the heritage of the Founding Father. For many centuries after the Plato's death, the difference between the modern meaning of Academia, founded by Plato, and Lyceum, founded by Aristotle, has very ancient origin and reflects the relative importance of both contributions for the contemporaries. However, starting with the, from the Middle Ages, when the Aristotle's work has been re rediscovered till the end of 19th century, his empiricism had much greater influence on the philosophy and science than Plato's objective idealism. The latter was reintroduced to science mostly by Einstein at the beginning of the 20th century, and remains the leading attitude in the theoretical fundamental science ever since. In philosophy and theology, this change is yet to come, although it seems clear that neither Aristotle nor Plato are at present really fully understood. We start with some recollection of the Plato's ideas. The early Plato's dialogues, like Protagoras or Gorgias, start from questions that Plato himself attributed to Socrates. What is real? What is knowledge? What is the difference between knowledge and opinion? What are the basics that no one can deny? At the later stage, starting with Republic, through Phaedrus and Symposium, and within 50 years of his activity, he developed the notion of objective idealism. What we observe is actually less real than what lies behind the observed world. The objective ideas do not have to possess their emanations in the observable world to be called and treated as real. Conversely, we observe the real world because there are ideas behind and nothing can exist without the underlying ideas behind, idea behind. Moreover, the observed world gives a very imprecise and blurred representation of the ideas that lie behind. And the world of ideas is much more, maybe infinitely more, but this notion was not used then, ideal than anything we can observe. In Philebus, Plato explicitly says that natural science is deficient in exactness because it does not refer to eternal ideas but to changing appearances, which are in time, not in eternity, and can never become an object of absolute knowledge. This view was emphasized even more in Timaeus, which deals chiefly with natural science. We may have some access to this ideal world, but it requires a specially trained mind and courage to turn around as in the famous allegory of the cave and only then we can start to gain knowledge. Knowledge refers to the eternal ideas while opinion to changing appearances. The set of notions was questioned by Aristotle who claimed that empirical evidence is the most fundamental. Existence is equivalent to the existence in the quote unquote real and observable world. And the abstract ideas and categories that he himself introduced are useful but by no means fundamental in our description and understanding of the world. Aristotle's approach, together with his fundamental contribution to logic and the theory of reasoning, turned out to be extremely effective in the development of experimental physics over the centuries and to the perfection of the scientific method. However, it had its limitations in our theoretical understanding of the fundamental level. We now turn to physics and its evolution over the last five centuries. The enormous progress achieved from then started in the Middle Ages. This period is now grossly underestimated, mostly because of intentionally negative attitude in the age of enlightenment towards the Middle Ages. The progress from then on triggered in a substantial way by rediscovering Hellenic sources 
was mainly due to the development of the scientific method and gathering in a systematic way both observations and with growing importance results of planned experiments. One could add here that more than half of presently used liver drugs come from the Middle Ages. The approach was based on the search for correlations among the rapidly increasing body of observations, using also the ending one. This experimental approach was dominant in the attempts to create a mathematical description and only then explain the observations and predict the new ones was very rare and concerned only the greatest giants like Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, or Maxwell. But even then, they were trying to explain only the visible observations by mathematical relations between the observed objects. The attitude that observations are everything what quote-unquote exists and the only purpose of physics is to find these mathematical relations between observable and measurable phenomena stems directly from the empiricism of Aristotle. All objects discussed were observable and it seemed that there is no need for ontological questions, whether the object exists and in what sense. Kepler used the Tycho Brahe observations of planet, by the way incredibly precise, without any need to ask whether planets exist. Maxwell treated electric and magnetic fields in a mechanical way as perfectly existing objects. The most notable exception is Galileo, who indirectly introduced the notion, not directly quote-unquote visible, of reference frame but it is known that he studied carefully the Hellenic sources mentioned above. In the 19th century, three great branches of physics were known. Mechanics, now called classical, thermodynamics, now converted into statistical physics, and electrodynamics, now also called classical. All those were con connected with beautiful mathematics, classical mechanics with variational calculus, thermodynamics with differential forms, and classical electrodynamics with the theory of partial differential equations. The success of these theories in explaining the whole body of observations available then led Albert Michelson in 1894 to claim that physicists discovered everything important, what was to be discovered, and the rest belongs to engineers. The situation, as is very well known, changed dramatically at the beginning of the 20th century. Seemingly innocuous facts, stability of atoms, black body radiation spectrum, naive questions like why is it dark at night with the deceptively obvious answer, led to the fundamental change in our understanding and the whole approach to the physical world. Although Planck made a very strange assumption about absorption and emission of electromagnetic waves in 1900 that led to his famous black body spectrum curve, it is the introduction of Einstein of the notion of Lichtquanta in 1905 that marked the real beginning of a giant leap for mankind, namely formulation of quantum mechanics. After some preliminary constructions, like Bohr's model of atoms or Sommerfeld rules, the real breakthrough was born out of pure thought in the Heisenberg, Jordan, and Born papers. Shortly later, the formulation of Schrödinger followed. Till now, the ontological question is unsolved. In what sense the objects in quantum mechanics like wave function exist? On one hand, they are unobservable in any direct way. This especially concerns the phase of the wave function. But on the other, govern everything what can be observed. They are subject to relations, like internal symmetries, that do not have direct representations in the observable world. Yet, they lead to physical loss that can be measured and verified. To illustrate this point, let us take the standard model describing up to presently available energies all interactions except gravity. It is generally based on the chiral gauge symmetry group SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. Having this information and the particle content plus some technical details like renormalizability, one could uniquely reproduce the action for the theory and with significant amount of work, predict the result of collisions at the Large Hadron Collider. However, 
neither chirality nor the gauge groups with the notions of color and hypercharge can be directly observed. They are purely theoretical concepts with only indirect consequences for observations. On the contrary, the very notion of a gauge group is based on the idea that the group connects the configuration that correspond to the same physical observation and cannot be distinguished. We could analyze for decades the results of the collisions of the LHC and we wouldn't invent the standard model that was constructed theoretically using the pure thought only indirectly guided by observations. The situation has a direct analogy with the Plato's notion of an objective idea and its emanation in observable world. The same concerns theory of gravity, general theory of relativity of Einstein. The equation that he wrote were not conceived to directly explain observations. His famous Gedanken experimenten suggested a symmetry in the ideal world that, by the way, cannot be observed and remains purely theoretical symmetry. I'm talking about the formorphism symmetry. And this theoretical symmetry dictated the form of the equations. At the time of writing, Einstein didn't know that these equations describe black holes, expansion of the universe, gravitational waves, as two days ago we, we had the Nobel Prize for that, and in fact all presently known gravitational phenomena, some of which discovered much, much later. It is this symmetry that dictated in a unique way the form of the equations. On one hand, it points to, ex to the existence of objective ideas, but on the other, to the amazing fact that by pure thought, if exercised by a genius, we can gain some insight into the world of those ideas. To illustrate the already mentioned difficulty of going from observations to the underlying laws of physics, let us give an example, although not so fundamental, but extremely important. The example of discovery of high temperature superconductors in 1986 by Bednosch and Müller. The discovery was not preceded by a theory, and until now, after more than 30 years and thousands of experiments, we still don't have a theory. It is of fundamental importance to notice that we cannot change anything in the laws of physics. We can just try to discover and understand them. Therefore, these laws transcend us and point to the deeper level that is not contained in the observable world that surrounds us. As we already emphasized, at this point, the Aristotle's empirical approach is replaced by the Plato's objective idealism. We now treat the laws of physics as independent entities, satisfying their own relations without necessity to be realized in an observable way. Although we hope that the relevant laws of physics are nevertheless realized in nature, and their consequences can in principle be observed. Let us remark that these laws do not explain or justify themselves, and their existence is a complete analogy to the Platonic objective ideas. Such a justification would need a different metaphysical origin. As Plotinus says, the maker of both reality and substance is beyond both reality and substance. As argued by Lutosławski, Plato's dialogues witness not one change of thought from Socratean to the objective idealism, but also the second one from objective idealism to the theory of soul and description of the transcendent element in ideas. It can be seen in the last dialogue, Timaeus. The very last dialogue loss is of different nature. The first change has its analogy in physics as a monumental effort over the centuries of transition from classical to modern physics. The second would mean a transition from physics to metaphysics and as such belongs to philosophy or theology rather than physics. In the final stage of Plato's thought, he stated that the ideas are not independent, as he claimed previously, but exist with the all overwhelming spirit. In his words, it was called the good. In the Plotinus words, it would be called the one. By entering the world of ideas, we in fact touch 
the transcendence that is far above our ability to understand. It is by far not obvious that even after we start to understand the transition from physics to metaphysics, we will be better understanding of the title question of the conference, what does it mean to exist in physics? Thank you.